You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. In this week's episode, Father Paul explains the significance of the phrase, male and female, he created them. In his words, a statement that is of the essence in the Bible because of the commandment to be fruitful and multiply. Father Paul is quick to note that all the living things of the earth are subject to this commandment, but an additional requirement is placed on the human being with respect to behavior. Finally, this week, Father Paul touches on something he covers extensively in the rise of Scripture, namely the importance and difference between the terms dominion and subdue and how we are to understand Adam's station in Genesis chapter 1. I am happy to present Father Paul on Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. So if we continue we hear that this man is in the image and likeness of God in his having granted, having been granted dominion over the fish of the sea. Notice how even the fish of the sea are included. Remember, the seas are not only waters, but also they are the place where the fish, and uh, we know from experience that you have a lot of amphibians, animals that live in the sea and on earth. And after that, science discovered that some of the animals that live only in the sea and cannot live except in the sea are mammals, like the whales and the seals. I'm not saying that the authors knew that. All I'm saying is that the text is saying that the human being is responsible of every nefesh haya. And then the vegetation is a gift of God for all of them, as we shall hear in the last two verses of chapter one. So he is to have dominion over all the animals and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So, verse 27, God created. Now we have the jump from make to create, but we talked about in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Let's take a little bit of time, and if we can finish the rest, we'll do it next time. I mean, it's a very loaded text. First of all, I'm confirmed in my statement about the image and the likeness because suddenly the likeness disappears and the image is repeated. He created man in his own image, in the image of Elohim. He created him. I mean, you have a repetition, created in his own image, in the image he created, and yet we don't hear likeness. But again, if you are a patristic writer, you start to say you are cold because at the beginning, Adam was only in the image of God. He was not in the likeness. And so, I mean, come on now. For a very simple reason that the word image is used more profusely in the Bible, Salem. That's it, the shadow. We have a repetition plus an addition, which is interesting. Male and female, he created them. Them, I mean, dual, plural. I mean, we don't have dual in Hebrew. You know, in Arabic, we have dual. That's why in Arabic, we use the dual to speak about the male and female, because grammatically, you may not use the plural. Anyway, both of them. Let's go for both of them. And the male and female is of the essence here. That technically, God, as I keep repeating, blesses the procreation in 28, be fruitful and multiply. 
and the human beings and all the other animals and even the birds and the fish and even the vegetation cannot proceed except through procreation. And this is how God created the human being. And in this sense, there is not even an essential difference between him and the others. Now, my hearers will have the impression that I'm jumping, but actually I'm not jumping. In my book, I discuss how we're going to see the same terminology later in the story of the flood about the animals. Where, and I'm going to go to an extreme example, but let's hold ourselves here. We'll get to it. You can only trust me or more preferably trust the text now that male and female later it is stunning to hear the writer speaking about the couples of animals you know in the ark of uh, as the animals he has different ways to say two by two one of the ways doesn't mean that the others are not important, but I don't want to overwhelm you now. But one of the ways is Ish and Ishto, which is very funny because Ish is the human being male, as we shall hear in chapter two. And the Isha, the feminine, is because she is a woman from the man. You remember what Adam, remember meaning, you know from chapter 2, that he will call his wife Isha because he's an Ish. Now imagine suddenly you hear someone telling you, let me put it in English, and all the animals in the zoo, each man and his woman, I mean, come on now, the people are going to be up in arms. You're making us animals. But this is precisely what the text will say later. And here I make my comment that male and female is very powerful because it's not Adam and Eve or man and woman. Theologians would have wished that 27 would have sounded man and woman, he created them. I mean, just here, theology and the preaching on weddings and so on, it's just catastrophe. <laughs> on purpose, he used male and female. They are two different words than man and woman. And they reflect totally sex. And in my dealing with Galatians, I show that this is very important that Paul refers to that. There is no male or female. He doesn't say there is no man or woman. As it stands, this verse 27 is very important. Again, we have the first mention of the man. We have created and not made. We have the stress on the image. And we have the male and female. I would say this is enough for the day because the following verse is going to take us on a different level of discussion. I would like to deal with having dominion and subduing, why we first only have dominion and then suddenly subdue and have dominion. You know, I'm pointing to all these things because this is how the text proceeds. You cannot control the text. You have to submit to it. It says what it wants to say. One more time, it plays an image and likeness, and that goes on only to likeness. It uses Adam and then Adam. Here you have the movement from him and them. Him, it's because the word Adam in Hebrew is grammatically masculine, so you have to say him. But then you have male and female, he created them. And then since here we have a different movement, earlier you had two becoming one, you know, image and likeness, and then only image repeated twice. Here we have having dominion, and then suddenly it is branched into 
subdue it and having dominion. Let's discuss it next time and then I'll take as much time as needed for the rest of chapter one. It's very heavy because precisely it is dealing with the human being that is the real problem in the biblical story, not in his essence, but in his behavior. And that's why already from now, we shall hear the commandment of God towards him that includes behavior. With the rest of the animals, it's only be fruitful and multiply. And suddenly here, we have an addition, and I would like to stop here. Repeatedly in the Pentateuch, there is this emphasis on our accountability to all of the creatures which God has set on the earth. I was wondering if you could expound on how someone hearing Genesis and attempting to submit to its commandment needs to understand how they should behave relative to all living things in the earth which belongs to the Lord. Let me begin with behaving toward one another. This is taken up in the story of Cain and Abel very quickly. I remind all of us that we cannot be either Adam or Eve. Okay? And my take on that is that Adam and Eve did not have a navel according to the text. We all have navels, which means our relationship with the human beings of the Bible begins with chapter 4, with Cain and Abel. We are the children of Adam. We are not Adam. We are like Cain and Abel. And already in that passage, the first story is the story relating the behavior of one towards the other. Right there, from the beginning. For me, this is powerful. But again, you know, everybody feels that I'm like Abel and not like Cain. I'm like the publican and not like Pharisee. That's why I can't stand in our tradition this Sunday of the Pharisee and the publican. Because all of us, all your parishioners, including yourself, somehow get the distinct feeling when you leave the church, not probably when you entered it, when you leave it as that you are the publican. Oh, come on now. So... That's a quick example how I'm trying to answer your question by showing that this appears immediately. But you're going to tell me, Father Mark, how about the earth? That's the scriptural trick. The earth has been taken care of already in the previous chapter 3, where God says that because of you, Adam, the Adama will be cursed. Unbelievable. But again, let's hear it in the original. is much more powerful. Adam, Adama, because of the Adam, the Adama, that gives life to everybody is going to be cursed. That's the ultimate curse. I mean, I know people always tell me, I'm not not sad for the 17 people who just died in Florida. But that is not to be equated, except in the mind of our egos. This is more important. I would have preferred that all Florida would have been torched, but these 17 people would still be living. I mean, come on, that's a joke. How could they be still be living in a torched Florida? So the cursing of the earth, it is the curse. So. You have it, but then, you know, one has to be a little bit patient, not that much patient. You don't have to wait until the end of the Bible, but you have to wait for a few chapters and then get to the story of the flood, where again, you're going to discover how the earth is very important because the animals during the flood, the sea animals were very happy. They were playing in the waters. <laughs> but referentially to you, the story of the flood is very powerful because Noah had to take care even of the birds of the air, which, by the way, and let me point out only in this conjunction now, I'll get back to it, that the birds 
are to multiply on earth. Verse 22. Let's hear it. And God blessed them, saying, blessed both the sea animals and their be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on earth. Very important. I stress this in my commentary in my book that remember the birds have to alight at one point. They live on earth, not in the sky. After Father Mark's question, one thing that I noticed in verse 26, when it says, let them have dominion, the word is not malach, which is to rule like a king, but it's radad, which is more like conquer or subdue. And it'd be so easy to misunderstand that in an egocentric, anthropocentric understanding. Can you help us understand why it would use the word conquer or subdue in this context? The difference between subdue and have dominion, in other words, in English, but I'm referring to the Hebrew. The Hebrew is have dominion, rada, which means technically to administer, to manage, to rule. And obviously, you have to be above the others position-wise. But subdue, which is from another root, and I'll speak more in detail about them next time if you want. Subdue is more the oppressive one. I'm talking about the original Hebrew. Let's leave it for next time, but let me answer your question. And I did the entire study of all the instances of have dominion, which is rada, and then subdue, kibesh. And I realized that the have dominion, this Radha, is always positive. Let me begin. Kibesh is always negative, whereas have dominion, Radha, you have to add with harshness in order to express harshness in the dealing. I have here in front of me some passages of the book. I say, on the other hand, Radha means rule the way a senior or someone in charge would. And then I have a list of examples where you have only Radha. But then I say this in turn explains why Radha, which is have dominion, needs to be qualified when used in a negative connotation the like of subjection, and I have a series of passages where we have the addition with harshness. That would be my answer to you. But then I would like to discuss it further next time in conjunction with the text in Genesis. The Rada is, if you like, neutral. Kibesh is definitely, we still have it in Arabic, Kavasa is to press down. It's like harsh already. But Radha is just the positive slash neutral ruling. You have to add harshness to make it sound that you're doing something with harshness. And again, your questions help me to take up the issue and again. And I hope my hearers will just not be excited. Oh, nice. I learned something new. This is something I really abhor. Just write down the notes and go back and use them when you hear other texts. Because you have to decide. I cannot decide for you. It's not if you like what I'm saying or dislike what I'm saying. Is not an ode to its correctness. It's high time that we really make this effort. My hope is getting surer that my hearers will be doing that because I'm trying to show them the fallacy of the presuppositional approach. Since man is the center of the universe, that's how we begin. Even if we don't say it, that's our premise. Let me go back to what I said about these texts, about having dominion or ruling with harshness. And so you have to see it for yourself. That's why I spent so many pages 
writing this because from my experience, I know I don't trust the people that they are going to read them if I mention them in the footnotes. But then I add a few footnotes to tell them there is more. Go and find it. So the submission ultimately is to the text itself, to which I refer as an it at the end of the book. It is there and it is closed and it was written completely in a strange language. Why? It doesn't matter. It is so. Because I could ask you the same thing. Why did Plato write in Greek and I have to learn Greek and so on? There is no why. It is so. You have to submit. The why comes in my book regarding that it was written in a language that was not known. It was made up on the basis of Aramaic and other languages. That's a different matter. But I'm saying that a text is a text. It's already there. There is no other way except to submit to it. My classic example regarding this is what I learned very quickly in America, which I didn't know before. I used to be always frustrated with the lawyers after they explain to you and they write the text and they read it with you and you sign. Enough is enough. And yet the lawyer tells you, okay, now, before you sign, I'm going to tell you what you're signing on. I mean, unbelievable. Why should he tell me? It's because he knows from experience that these words are technical words. But this is how the legal thing, it's like uh, medicine, you know. But I am signing, not he. So his duty is to tell me what I'm signing for. Now, what amazes me in North America is that the people accept to be belittled in this way by a lawyer. Because they know that it is for their own good. And that's the thing with the Bible. Remember Leviticus, the Roman. It's for your own good that I'm telling you these things. But then, at that point, when we deal with scripture, we forget legalism and we go back to Platonism. No, what do you mean you decide for me and I can say whatever I want? No, you can't. But I mean, you can, but then you may get into trouble because later people will show you that you have signed on this. Take, for instance, a deed for a property or a will. Come on, friends, come on. I'm speaking American style now. But that's how we are. We choose when to obey and submit and when not to. Well, okay, that's fine with me. But then when you pay the price, don't come to me to help you out. And this is of the essence because ultimately on the last day, God is going to be the judge. And this is a legal title. Another classical example in this vein. During the semester, I'm your teacher. But during final, I'm your examiner. Big difference functionally. I thank you for having given me this opportunity to say this. And I'm sure this is going to come again and again and again in the podcast because this is what the entire scripture is all about. A shepherd who is the father of the flock taking care of him, but then uh, you have to accept his staff. Remember that the word tribe in Hebrew is the same word that means staff, which is unbelievable. I mean, the choice. I mean, you can't render it in translations because when I say tribe and when I say staff, you're healing two words, which 
means the staff of the shepherd is of the essence for the life of the shepherd, which is the flock. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.